and is eventually representing you in Congress will be representing one of the fastest growing districts in the country. We're playing musical chairs here. Um, just give you a little background. I was invited to do this. I'm glad to do it. Um, yeah, I think this will be one of uh, a number of opportunities you have to hear from these candidates. Um, and of course, later some that um, uh, were not um, able to attend today. Um, and I hope we, we hope we will facilitate a good discussion. This is a forum, not a debate. And, you know, we're going to try to keep them to the time, but we want you to, you know, to hear from these candidates, make your own impressions, tell your friends about it and use it as you start to, um, uh, you know, to foster some decisions, but, you know, for, for a lot of you, this is, you know, your, your first opportunity and my first opportunity to get to know some of these candidates, um, a little better. Um, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Starting with, if we will, we'll just go down my left, starting with uh, Ms. Elmer's, just introduce your name, then we'll come back and do opening statements. Hi, Justin Morrow. Nice to meet you. Devan, we will um, start uh, with you on that end to do opening statements. Good. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm Dr. Morrell, and as Mr. Barber pointed out, Everybody here is gonna have the same ideal, basically, on, on the major stances. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce you to myself as a person, because I'm not new. So I grew up in a military family, uh, as brought, moved all over the United States. And um, unfortunately, at, in 1998, we became a Gold Star family. So I connect uh, very closely with our veterans in healthcare and services for our veterans and our active duty military. I went on, you know, I went, I went to undergraduate and I went on to medical school. So I'm a physician and I specialize in emergency room psychiatry and in forensic psychiatry. And if, if you don't know, forensic psychiatry is the intersection between law and psychiatry. So I have a very firm background in law as well as healthcare law and opiate crisis and some of the mental health needs. And I think this past year has been a prime example as to why we need more healthcare providers and more people with mental health experience in Congress. I mean, we have had a lot of healthcare decisions being made for us, and they're not being made by people with experience. They're not being made by the people that understand insurance companies. They're not being made by people that understand mental health, like our children's mental health, because that's being seriously compromised this last year. So while everybody here has wonderful qualifications, I think sometimes it's important to make sure that you have a diverse field of candidates in your offices, because we all have something to offer. And I think my, what I have to offer is a little bit distinct and a little bit unique and something that's a little bit lacking in Congress right now. So I encourage everybody to come up and talk to me. I don't have a big campaign staff. If you, if you contact my, my campaign, it's me. <laughs> so, so you'll get me when I'm not on call or, or you know, not, not handling patients, but I will come out. I'm happy to meet in the community. I want to talk to people. I want to see what everybody in this region needs. But also importantly, I know what I don't know. And I know that there's a lot of other candidates um, in, across the state that have experience in farming. So we have David Rouser, who is running south of us, right? Oh, I'm in Cumberland County, so he's south of me. And I say, you know, if somebody's going to ask me a question about that, he's who I'm probably going to talk to because he has the experience. I know not to make decisions on things that I have not researched and that I don't know about. So I think the best thing you can do is surround yourself with people that can support you and that can give you advice and give you information and so you can make a smart decision. So I'm not going to do, in, you know, like quick instinct answers to things. If you ask me something I don't know, I'm going to let you know. I don't know, but I'm happy to talk to you about it and I'm happy to research it. So come up to me with your questions. This is like my first introduction to everybody. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thanks everybody for their opening statement. We're going to run through a few questions here, kind of in the rapid fire. So we're looking for about a 30 second to one minute answer. And I want to start on the um, issue of, uh, of Ukraine. 
If you could tell us one thing that the United States and the Biden administration is doing right with the situation in Ukraine, and one thing that we are doing wrong and should you do different, and we'll start with Chad, go back and... I mean, I'll keep it a little bit brief, but I think the one thing that we're doing correctly is, of course, supporting the, the Ukrainian residents. The citizens have absolutely nothing to do with this. What we've done wrong is it's been going on for years. This isn't a new um, issue. The United States has been doing, or certain individuals from the United States, I wouldn't say the United States itself, has been doing some underhanded um, business over in Ukraine, bioweapons facilities, um, money laundering through through Ukraine, and I think we all know what you know what parties are potentially responsible for that. So this isn't something that just started today. It's not going to be solved today. And I think we kind of gave Putin, like him or don't like him, we gave him some ammunition to use to create this conflict. So I think there needs to be some responsibility that the U.S. is taking for that situation. So what we're doing right is somewhat supporting the citizens. But what we're doing wrong is being dishonest for a long time leading up to it. It's a show of hands question. Do any of our candidates believe that U.S. Air Force based troops ought to be enforcing a no fly zone in Ukraine? The United States? Or yeah, the United States. Our military. Does anybody think that our military ought to be involved in a no fly zone in Ukraine? All right, see, we have some agreement no, there. Okay, thank you. Now, um, another another show of hands, or not a show of hands. Um, the first vote, if you are um, uh, ultimately elected in this race, would be for what I think all of us would hope is a Republican U.S. House Speaker. Anybody here planning to not vote for the current House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy. Well, we got some agreement here. Okay, now, I'm gonna start with this question to uh, Devan and work, work our way back. A question about, um, question about um, there our situation on the border and immigration. Uh, all of these candidates are, are certainly for uh, doing something about the uncontrolled um, border on, on our uh, on the south, as we've all seen. At the same time, as you drive through Johnston and Harnett counties, you still see tobacco tobacco fields. You still see people in need of labor. And closing the border does not necessarily fix the immigration system. So my question is, besides securing the border. If we could do that, what needs to happen next to make sense out of America's convoluted immigration system? Devan, we'll start with you. Um, I agree with the prior two gentlemen. However, I think there's a big part of the illegal immigration problem that's not recognized. Um, a lot of people are coming in on temporary visas, right? So, okay, we secure our borders. We have all of that done. Then where's the next source? And the next source is visas. They're coming on temporary visas. They're coming on student visas and then they disappear. They never show up for their first class. They don't show up to their dorm rooms. They're gone. They're gone, and, it's, and the schools don't report it. Schools are getting some funding for having these, these visa applicants at their, at their schools. So this is where actually quite a few of the terrorists are, are coming from. They're coming in kind of legally on temporary visas, and then when they disappear, we never find them. So they need to be vetting these applicants a little bit better. They need to see who's funding these applicants to come into college because they also they have sponsors. Um, and we need to look at other things. I mean, the, the drug war is terrible, but child trafficking is, is even worse. And that's something that we're not, we're not really focusing on, on in this discussion and, and securing the border, north, south, and people that are applying coming in. And then they bring in their families on these temporary visas as well, and then they disappear. So we need to have better tracking on the people that we are vetting and letting into the country as well. Jessica, we'll start with you on this question and, and, and work down this way and go back to the other end. Um, and certainly f feel free to disagree with my premise of the question here. But it seems to me that it, with Republicans, there is, a, um, there is a tension with big tech 
in that we generally don't favor overregulation and in government um, involvement in the free market system. Nobody has to get on Facebook. Nobody has to get on Twitter or Instagram. Um, at the same time, this is having an enormous effect on the ability for both Republicans to communicate, the appropriate communications of children. Um, a lot of directions you can go with this, but I guess my question is, if, if you were a member of the House of Representatives, um, what would be your view on what um, Congress needs to do anything about, quote unquote, big tech, if anything? Um, well, I think that's the beauty of a free market society. They have a product, they can sell it, and they can administrate it in, in whatever way they want to. I think it kind of is more that the conservatives need to start creating their own um, organizations. So, and, and it is happening. We have we have Trump creating his social media. We have things like MeWe coming out where conservatives can have a voice and you're not going to be silenced. Where I think there is a problem is that um, free speech is being oppressed unequally. So that is what should be addressed is like, um, you know, what rights are you allowed to tromp on? And the, the answer is none, and it should be equal across the board. But as far as private businesses, private businesses can do what they like to do, and we don't have to give them our business. Thank you. We're going to ask you. Oh, no, I was saying these are great questions. <laughs> well, Line squirrel on a nut, you know. <laughs> um, we're going to go about two or three more questions and then close these statements. We want to be appreciative of everybody's uh, time today, and, and, and thank you for being here. Chad, we'll start with you. Uh, President Trump remains one of the most popular figures in the Republican Party. He has endorsed one of the candidates that chose not to attend this forum today. On the other hand, Mr. Trump continues to focus much of his anger on the previous election, and he continues to be a divisive figure in the country. What is the proper role of the former president in the modern day Republican Party and in this race in particular? You know, I think a lot of people judge Donald, Donald Trump partially, right? It's a terrible job. You have to have a certain personality or personality disorder or whatever you want to call it <laughs> to be successful in that position. Um, so he's successful because of his characteristics and he's also criticized for them. And he, you know, you're also getting limited information. You're getting the media's cuts of, of what he's saying. So you're, you're not getting the truth all the time. The one thing I would criticize about some of his endorsements this time around is that I don't think he took the opportunity to speak to all of candidates before he made a decision of who he was going to endorse. And he's endorsing some pretty, um, I would say some outrageous candidates, some, some people that maybe are going to get a lot of attention and, and they're going to be on the news and they're going to be on social media, but they aren't necessarily going to be the people that are going to make the best decisions for the residents. And I think that, um, you know, we're in a swing district. And if you want your candidate to win, you have to bring somebody after the primaries that's going to be a good competition. And bring in somebody who's a little bombastic against the other side is not necessarily going to end up in the result that you want because it's going to polarize. So those would be my criticisms so far of, of this election. Thank you. That's everybody. So this new district that contains, um, I had a nice tour of it on the way down here today, um, the southern parts of Wake County, fast growing, um, moderate Republicans, a lot of liberals, um, the parts of Harnett County, all of Johnston and all of Wayne, it, it, it seems to me is somewhat of a microcosm, of a lot of what we see in America and, and as particularly North Carolina, um, very fast growing suburbs, um, some parts of downtown core, farming and rural communities. Uh, so two part question, and we'll go 90 seconds on this and then we'll move to closing statements. How can you, as a member of Congress, um, bridge the urban-rural divide to effectively represent this community? And what about you makes you particularly um, talented and able to represent a district 
as such you are running in. Um, and we'll start with the van and come down this way or that way. So on a personal level, I probably relate a little bit more to suburban urban. Right. I, I went to school. I've been in training in more urban areas. I have a lot of experience and generationally, I'm probably a little bit more connected um, to, to that half of the community. However, for my job, I listen to people. That's what I hear every day. I hear people across all demographics. I hear their struggles. I hear what they need help with. I hear what services they don't have. And I listen. So while I may not have the personal experience of the rural communities in, the, in, you know, in these counties, I'm listening. So I'm willing to, to take in everybody else's perspective and I'm willing to apply that. So that's what I can offer is that I'm, I'm, I'm willing to listen to people and, and willing to uh, learn about what is important and maybe where, where this particular areas of struggles are. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to wrap up our Q&A uh, part of this. But before we move into closing sections, let's give a big round of applause for all these. I speak for the, for the people out here and the people watching online and the people who will read about this later um, to say that, you know, the, the the thirteenth is going to be well represented, and um, and uh, the, we appreciate your commitment to public service. We're going to go one minute for the closing statements, and uh, since Chivalry is still alive here in Harnett County, I'm going to start with the women. I'm going to go to Jessica, and then Renee, and then work back and end with the van. So, uh, Jessica, uh, one minute, uh, close us out here. Thank you. Okay, didn't really pre prepare a closing, but um, I just want to point out, and if it hasn't been obvious with my answers, I'm a, more of a moderate Republican, right? I'm probably going to fall a little bit, as if what we were talking about, Nancy Pelosi's moderate I mean, <laughs> liberal, then I'm, I'm definitely a little bit more moderate Republican. So it's a little socially more moderate, definitely financially conservative. Um, I, I do agree with the majority of the principles of everybody on this panel, but I do think that when we're when we're looking past the primaries, you do need to think about who, who is going to be a good candidate to, to run against, who they're bringing to the table, and who's going to be able to draw the people in the middle more to the right. Because that's what this election is going to be based on this year, is really the people in the middle. Which direction are we going to take them? And hopefully, hopefully ours to the reasonable side.